This video is sponsored by Ground News. And if there is no God, then there is nothing ultimately right or wrong. Just because their names are there doesn't mean you rose from the dead. No, it doesn't. If people can be trusted on where you can verify them, you probably ought to trust them where you can. If there is an infinite standard of justice out there, we deserve punishment. What is the evidence that's having these scientists and virtually all scientists saying the universe had a beginning? Wait, what? Virtually all scientists now think the universe had a beginning. As in, there was nothing and then everything. The universe had a beginning. Frank, are you lying again? Are you lying for Jesus? Loads and loads of uh, early universe cosmologists, and almost none of them think the universe had a beginning. <laughs> That's science communicator Phil Halper, who's interviewed pretty much every brilliant scientist alive working on the early universe, and he's telling you how it is. Frank is wrong. Very wrong. <laughs> this is probably what they did think, you know, in the 1980s or something, but today uh, cosmologists don't think that. They think the Big Bang was just an evolution from a hot, dense state, leaving open the yeah. question whether it was a beginning or not. So, not a great start for the Christian apologist Frank Turek, but to anyone familiar with his track record of misrepresenting scientific topics, this isn't surprising. Egregious inaccuracies in the name of Jesus is a feature when it comes to apologists. It's not a bug. The institutions, often religious schools, invite non-experts, apologists, onto the stage to spew absolute nonsense. And today, oh boy, do I have a doozy of an example. Ever heard of thermodynamics? And the second law of thermodynamics says that the universe is running down, it's running out of usable energy. But before we get to this supposed proof of God, let's talk about misinformation. Like many of you, I've watched with concern as findable, reliable, objective news has become increasingly challenging. You are fake news. Social media algorithms prioritize sensational headlines that generate clicks, sacrificing depth and nuance. This is precisely why ground news has become an indispensable tool in my daily routine. It enables me, you, to analyze multiple sources covering the same story, examining their bias, credibility, and ownership patterns. In a world where it's easy to get stuck in an echo chamber, Ground News provides a way out. You can check them out at ground.news slash rationality. Let me demonstrate its value with a recent example, Brazil's temporary suspension of X. Big story. Well, with Ground News, I can instantly pull over 400 articles from around the globe to see that over 60% of them are rated highly factual, a rating indicative of how subjective the reporting is likely to be. Looking closer at how different outlets cover the story, I can see how each is titling and spinning the narrative. While some sources focused on speculating about Elon Musk's response to the ban, others provided straightforward reporting on the Brazilian Supreme Court's direct order. This comprehensive feature is invaluable. It helps you maintain perspective on the full scope of any story near instantly, not just a single viewpoint. In an increasingly polarized world, this balanced approach to news consumption has never been more essential. Ground News is giving my viewers 40% off their unlimited access vantage plan. Experience it for yourself at ground.news slash rationality. If you value balanced, reliable news coverage, I'm confident that you'll find this tool as indispensable as I have. It's thanks to Ground News that I can keep making projects like this, and so, if you do sign up, you'll be helping out the channel as well. Thank you. And the second law of thermodynamics says that the universe is running down, it's running out of usable energy. As time goes on, uh, the amount of hydrogen atoms in that sun are burning up. Ultimately, that sun is gonna burn out and we're all gonna go to heat death. Don't worry, apparently it's several billion or million years from now. All right, let's pause here for a moment. Did you catch that? Several billion or million years. It's several billion or million years from now. As Phil points out. I love the fact that he doesn't know whether the sun's gonna die in like a few million years or a few billion. <laughs> <laughs> He's so confident about everything, but like that's such a yeah. basic high school fact. Well, this is a perfect example of the problem we're dealing with when it comes to apologists. Frank speaks with absolute certainty about complex physics while stumbling over basic astronomical facts that any high school student could look up. It's a red flag, but let's continue with his argument. Think of the universe as a dying flashlight. Well, suppose I had turned the flashlight on an infinitely long time ago, if you could. Would there be any light coming out of it today? 
No, it would have used up all its energy. Well, think about the universe as having batteries, like a flashlight. If you turned the universe on an infinitely long time ago, there'd be no energy left. The sun would be dead. We wouldn't have any heat. We wouldn't have any energy right now. But since the sun is still burning, that would mean that the universe had a beginning. Now, this might sound compelling if you're not familiar with physics. It's got that surface level plausibility that makes for great apologetics. But as philosopher Dan Linford explains, Sometimes religious apologists think that the second law of thermodynamics is this kind of inviolable law of, of physics that it couldn't have any possible violations. That's not true. This is crucial. What Frank presents as an absolute unbreakable law actually has more nuance than he suggests. The second law of thermodynamics emerges from statistical mechanics. It describes the most likely behaviors of systems. It's not an inviable cosmic rule. But there's an even more fundamental problem with Frank's argument, which philosopher Alex Malpass brilliantly exposes. If suppose a flashlight's always been on, but also that it's only got a finite amount of energy and it will run out of that energy, in a finite amount of time. That's true that those three things are contradictory, that you can't have all three of those things, but like, yeah. I don't see that anything really follows from that. This is where Alec shows us the sleight of hand in Frank's argument. Yes, a flashlight with finite energy that's been on for an infinite time would be contradictory. Well done, Frank. Amazing. But watch what happens when we correct the analogy. You know, if you change one of those assumptions, suppose the flashlight starts off, or starts off, but at every point in the past, it's got a finite amount of energy. And at the point earlier than that, it's got like some increment more, right? So it's always just going greater and greater energy as you go back. Well, that doesn't follow that it would be off today, right? Nothing follows from the fact that it's on about how far back into the past it goes, right? It could go infinitely far back, or it could go back to yesterday, and that would be it. So the, the analogy, it seems to me, only works if you presuppose that time does have a beginning. And there it is, the fatal flaw in Frank's argument. His entire analogy only makes sense if you already assume the conclusion he's trying to prove. This is what philosophers call begging the question, and it's a classic move in apologetics. Frank starts by assuming that the universe had a beginning, then constructs an analogy that only maps on if that assumption is true. It's circular reasoning dressed up as science. America is number one. Because it's first in the world. That's an airtight argument, though. But since he's criticizing a model of the universe that's infinite, he needs to create an analogy that actually maps onto an infinite universe, as Alex did. If we consider a system where energy increases as we look backward in time, suddenly Frank's proof collapses. In this model, the flashlight could have been on forever and still be shining today. Because while at each point in the past it had more energy than the day after, this doesn't somehow prove that it's ever going to go out one day, nor that it was once put on. But maybe you're still confused. And if you are, don't worry, you're not alone. And this points to a deeper problem with apologetic arguments. Frank and others like him deliberately choose analogies that exploit our everyday intuitions. Things like dying flashlights and running down batteries, because these objects trigger associations with finite, human-scale systems that we're all familiar with. Consequently, even when scientists and philosophers correct these analogies, there's still a nagging feeling that maybe the apologist has a point, because we're still thinking in terms of familiar, finite objects and their associations. But the universe isn't a flashlight or a battery. To really understand what scientists are talking about when they discuss infinite models, we need analogies that actually map onto these concepts without exploiting our everyday associations and intuitions. Let me give it a go. Consider fractals. When you look at a fractal pattern, each section is smaller than the one before it in a linear sequence. But there's absolutely nothing about this pattern that suggests that it must eventually get to a smallest possible fraction. The pattern could extend infinitely in both directions without contradiction. You see, once you start using analogies that actually represent the models that scientists consider, the rhetorical games played by apologists become obvious. They're not engaging with the real science. What they're doing is exploiting our natural tendency to think in terms of familiar finite objects to make their arguments seem more plausible than they actually are. Still, this exploitation of intuition through misleading analogies is only part of the problem. Let's return to Dan Linford's point about thermodynamics, because it reveals something even more fundamental about how apologists mishandle science. There are a variety of different ways of explaining the facts that when we look back through time, we see this entropy gradient. We see that if you go back 
in time, the entropy of the whole universe seems to be getting smaller and smaller. Unlike Frank's oversimplified presentation, actual physicists and philosophers are wrestling with multiple models that could explain what we observe. Consider this first possibility that Dan describes. For instance, it could be that our universe was born out of uh, a black hole in another universe. In that case, the degrees of freedom that are, in other words, the things that are visible to the subsequent universe, that is to our universe, would be just the things that fall into the black hole, and that would give it the appearance of having this initial low entropy state. There's an interesting model, right? Our universe might be like a bubble growing inside of another universe. When we look back and see decreasing entropy, we might just be seeing the limited information that made it through the black hole boundary. It's like looking through a keyhole. You might think you're seeing everything, but you're actually only seeing a small part of what's really there. Or consider another possibility. It could be that there's um, some kind of dynamical process that decreases the entropy in a previous universe and gives rise to our universe. This model suggests something like a cosmic recycling process. Instead of entropy always increasing until everything dies out, there might be a natural process that can reverse this trend under certain conditions. Think of it like a cosmic pendulum rather than a one-way street to heat death. We simply can't rule this out. We don't know enough. It could be that there's no, uh, th there is just no equilibrium state of our universe. So the, en the entropy can just keep on increasing forever. But if you pick at any point in time, the entropy at that time is going to be lower than the entropy at subsequent times. And this is similar to Alex's infinite flashlight analogy. It could be that the universe does not have a maximal entropy state that Frank's analogy requires. The universe might be able to keep developing new structures and complexity indefinitely without ever reaching a final dead state. It's currently not known why the early universe had such a low entropy, but that's something that physicists are currently working on resolving, and it's something for which we have multiple different contending models. In essence, then, we don't have an answer. And so Frank, a non-expert, has absolutely no business confidently insisting that we do to impressionable youth. And do you know what? The institutions that platform Frank and other apologists as experts should be ashamed of themselves. It is a disgrace. And this is what makes apologetics so frustrating from an academic perspective. While genuine scientists acknowledge uncertainty and explore multiple possibilities, apologists like Frank present complex scientific questions as if they have simple, definitive answers that just so happen to support their theological positions. They bypass all the nuance, all the competing models, all the ongoing research, and jump straight to absolute certainty. Am I right or am I right or am I right? Right. It's not just bad science, it's the opposite of how science works. It is the antithesis of science. It's pathetic. It is a grave disservice to our youth. It should not be acceptable. This is why apologetics is viewed as a circus by academia. The clowns don't play by the rules of intellectual honesty and rigorous investigation. Instead, they cherry-pick scientific concepts, oversimplify them beyond recognition, and present them with a certainty that no actual scientist would claim. It's a performance that evidently convinces those who are unfamiliar with how science actually works, but it portrays everything that genuine scientific inquiry stands for. Anyhow, I just want to extend my sincere thanks to Phil Halper Alex Malpass, and Dan Linford for taking the time to address apologetic content. Most academics understandably avoid engaging with apologetics altogether, viewing it as an intellectually dishonest distortion of their fields of study. But having professionals like these step up to analyse and critique these arguments is invaluable. It equips those who counter apologetics with the tools and knowledge needed to expose these misrepresentations for what they are. If you'd like a deeper dive into their full analysis and to explore more counter-apologetic episodes, you'll find their links in the description below. And speaking of support, I just want to thank my patrons, who without videos like this simply wouldn't be possible. Your backing allows me to dedicate the time and resources needed to create this content. Finally, I'd like to thank Ground News for sponsoring this channel. If you're looking to get unbiased news coverage and understand different perspectives on current events, Ground News is an essential tool. By using my link below, you'll not only be supporting me and the Rationality Rules team, but you'll also get 40% off your Vantage subscription. Thank you for watching.